This holy night is the moment when we will live what we are doing until the end of time at the altar. It is the same presence that we have. However, theologians have gone into it in some depth and it is presumed that the consecration on this night was participating in the sacrificial value and power of what was being done by anticipation. Remember what we are taught, a sacrifice in an unbloody manner. Before that blood was shed, which is actually to be found in the words of consecration, it's in the future. And the way in which the presence happened at that point would have been a sacramental presence of the body of the Lord as it was, and that therefore there would have been, theologically speaking, a difference between that consecration and that which the Prince of Apostles, Peter, would have had at the first renewal of that ceremony, presumably after Pentecost. Why? At that point, the only body that was, was the glorified body. And therefore, what was happening was exactly the same at that point as what we are making to happen right now. And what is more, those same experts will tell us that the words used by Simon Peter at what had been the first celebration after the Lord's victory, they say after Pentecost probably, were pretty close to what we use in the Roman Rite. Now if one compares the forms of consecration and institution to come down to us. We have two families coming down within Scripture. Luke, Paul, in Corinthians, and Mark, Matthew. We are using the Roman canon, which is a variant of some significance, because we have one word coming in which is not in any of those families. It's et eterni, the new and eternal covenant. Note that, because it's something so ancient that no reform could change. It's always been in the Roman Rite. Moreover, in the Roman Rite we have something which we do not find in the other rites that have come down to us in the East. It's this expression, hunc preclarum calicem, this precious chalice, which means that Peter was using the same chalice. So if one looks into the Eucharistic prayer, which we have, and which on this night is slightly different because of extra words from antiquity coming in, because they have those reference to this very night. If one looks into them, one sees very clearly that one is handling probably the words that they were using in the earliest celebrations. In essence, the proof, the very Hebrew language. Notice all these references. Abraham, Abel, Melchizedek, the angel, St. John the Baptist is there. It's all points of reference familiar, which says that we're actually hanging antiquity fossilized. As time goes on, these families go on also. 
but some things are constant in all. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Always there. Lift up your hearts and so on. Always there. The Tisavion, thrice holy, always there. And what is always there also, by the way, is that they're carrying on from what they know, from more ancient worship, that they face a higher power and not each other. Sacrificial language is also used from the beginning and is developed in the early fathers. Just remember that in case you forget two millennia, as though we were the first to get it right. When still an Evangelical Baptist, I started to look into early texts, apocryphal ones, and so on, and I was shocked to find that in all the early texts, there is no doubt whatsoever that the real presence is understood just as the present Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox understand it. That actually was uncomfortable because that means that vastly the weight of evidence is contrary to what we were being told. It's rather like a jury when massively the whole world says one thing and you as a group think you've got it right you want to be careful of presumption. Newman put it this way, securus judicat orbis terrarum. Securely judges the whole wide world. Ouch. It was uncomfortable also for him. He was actually sitting on the very branch, the branch theory, but he was constantly seeing the beat sawing off in his theology. It wasn't working. And he also saw this. If you start believing in things Catholic as an Anglican, then you're in a problem. What makes it happen? A valid priest ordained by a valid bishop. And he went into that, and he saw the huge problem. It's this. No matter how a man is dressed, how high his mitre, what his belief may be or not be, if he hasn't got it, he can't hand it on. And he looked at the thing word by word. He saw that the Anglican transmission of orders might or might not work. But he put it this way, we know that the Catholic one, and he meant by that the Roman Catholic one, works, and it's the only safe one in the West. And he put it this way, in the matters of sacraments, and he meant by that sacraments that give rise to other sacraments, one has to be tutsior, safer still than just hoping for the best. That is hugely important. If, as some young men might be on this diet, they're adoring the Lord at the altar of repose and hearing a still small voice, which often happens in this sacred night, you too could be a priest. They need to know that it matters hugely where they're getting the orders from. I remember talking to a convert friend who had been an Anglican priest and he said to me, his posh accent, very uncomfortable being a high church Anglican because you're always reading Catholic books and they're the very ones to tell you that you're not a priest. So he came over. One day I was talking to a deacon in our monastery who was about to be ordained a priest he was on his ordination retreat at our monastery, which wasn't far from Rome. He too had been a high Anglican. And his brother was still a high Anglican, 
and a hair Anglican priest in inverted commas. One day, his brother was at the altar. He was getting close to the consecration and he was a little worried because he too was seeing the problem. The only thing was that he had a family to feed and his whole career and security depended on what he was doing at the altar. He asked the Holy Ghost discreetly to make it known what the will of God was. As he got to the consecration, he heard, and I asked my friend, the deacon, did he really hear, or was it his own imagination? And he said straight away, no, he heard it. He heard in his heart this word, don't genuflect. The still, small voice. That still, small voice which hovers over the tabernacle. Rather, as in the Eastern Rite to this day, they ventilate the holy gifts with the wings of the Holy Spirit, suggested by the flapping of the veil over the chalice. It's the same spirit that hovered over the face of the deep, that brought order out of disorder. And this is power, usually humble and hidden, veiled, because it has to be to be our bread of life, but occasionally not. I just conclude with one little theological problem. It's this. If you've ever been to the likes of Lanciano, you will see there a total Eucharistic miracle. Not just blood flowing from a host, but the host itself transformed. There we have a problem. Is that the real earthly flesh and blood of the Saviour? Or is it, and this is what St Thomas Aquinas, whose relic by the way is there, says, in the case of total Eucharistic miracles, what is happening there is a double miracle. Because the place of the body and blood of the Lord as it walked the earth is now in heaven, what's happening there is, to avoid the problem of having the Lord, as it were, in his pre-resurrection body on earth again, what's happening is that the Lord is producing by transubstantiation the essential change into the body and blood of the Lord, but is working a second miracle to confect an apparent flesh and blood which is containing the real presence, but is another accidental miracle, a double miracle therefore. When St John Paul II went to Siena, where I was ordained, the cathedral, he went also to the Eucharistic miracle. It's in the Church of St. Francis, which is actually not too far away from the cathedral. In every Corpus Christi, the miracle is carried by the Archbishop through the ancient streets from one church to the cathedral, where it's adored. And it was this, the, robe, the taking of the hosts by a robber to get. Now, he didn't actually really want the hosts. He wanted the precious miracle, or a battle. But the Lord indicated that he wasn't amused and got through to the thief just to put them somewhere, and he put them in a money box of another church. The whole city went into prayer and fasting, the palio was called off, which was due, a massive event, the horse riding, and they were found. Somebody prompted, was prompted to find them, and they never, since 1730, changed one bit. I've seen them quite often. They're perfect, not a tiny jot of time. A perpetual miracle, and John Paul II went, and I've seen a picture of him before them, and all he could say was, Je presenza, je presenza. The presence is there. The presence is there.